Well, I'm going to preach to you today on freedom. We just celebrated July 4th here, and uh, some of you may not really know the history about July 4th. I was kind of astounded at sometimes these talk show people, they go out on the streets and they ask folks questions, and I'm like, man, we need to pray. We need to pray for the younger generation. One of the questions was, when did we win our independence? And one guy said, uh, I think 1984. I'm like, dear Lord, help us, Jesus. But anyway, so we celebrate on July 4th the independence of our nation from England. July 4th is not just hamburgers, hot dogs, and barbecues. We were liberated as a new little nation from the control of the British Empire. Otherwise, we would all be speaking with really funny English accents today. Uh, our, our oldest son and his wife, they're on staff at a, a church in Santa Monica, and most of the people there are from England, which I find kind of interesting. God's sending folks from other nations to help America, but thank God we'll take the help, right? So when they were first visiting this church and d deciding whether they were going to become a part of it, John said to their oldest daughter, she's probably about six, five or six at the time, and he said, so honey, Olivia, how did you like the church today? And she said, I loved it, Daddy, but how come they all speak with funny accidents? <laughs> she called them accidents. <laughs> so I'm thankful that we're not speaking with funny accidents in here today, <laughs> that our nation is free. July 4th, 1776 was the last battle that was fought. And you might think that it was fought in Washington, D.C. It was actually fought in New York City. Yep, New York City. It's where the last stand was taken and our liberty was won. And then, you know, I think I like to Google. Thank God for Google. I don't know how we knew stuff before Google, but thank God for Google. And anyway, so I was just Googling some things about July 4th. And I'm sure all of you enjoyed or maybe enjoyed the beautiful fireworks displays. I like looking at them from a distance, not particularly fond of illegal things popping and going off in the street in front of our house. But you know, anyway, I'm glad we're all safe and sound here today. Nobody got lit on fire or anything. That's good. But um, I was just wondering, why do we celebrate July 4th with fireworks. So I discovered this. John Adams, who was one of our founding fathers, he was the second, also our second president, he made a declaration on July 4th, 1777, and he said this, we won our independence with bombs and rockets bursting in the air, lighting up the sky. Henceforth, we will celebrate our freedom by lighting the skies with fireworks, reminding us of the price that was paid for our freedom. So that's why we have fireworks. So when you see them bursting in air, we ought to say, thank God for our nation. Thank God for our freedom. There is a cause to celebrate. Our nation is not perfect. Our nation has a lot of issues, particularly right now, but we still are the land of the free because of the brave. And I am thankful for men and women who have paid the ultimate price so we can sit in here today and we can raise our hands, we can raise our voice, we can worship Jesus freely. Amen? Not being afraid of being arrested. <laughs> freedom that we enjoy today came at a high price. Our third president, Thomas Jefferson. Who was the first president? Oh, very good class. That was one of the questions asked too and hardly anybody knew it. So I'm just, you all did good. Anyway, so you learned something today. Thomas Jefferson is the third president. And he said this, freedom is not free. It is watered with the blood of every generation. And I just want to boldly say today, God bless America. And some of the words to our anthem is, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. 
Think about that. The author of that song was saying, God, we need you to protect our land. God, we need you to guide this great nation. I love that phrase, guide her with the light from above. Darkness, division, and hatred are trying to get a stronghold in our nation. But we as believers, this is our territory. This is our land, land that I love. We declare that it shall not prevail, but liberty and freedom and justice for all shall rule and reign in our nation. As a matter of fact, Lord, we lift our hands and we lift our voice right now and we pray for our country. We say that we are one nation under God, under God united under the banner of liberty and freedom. And we say that our great nation shall fulfill her destiny and we will come to the end of days walking in our plan and walking in our purpose and we cry out, Lord, for there to be healing in our nation. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 declares if we will humble ourselves, if we will pray, if we will <coughs> seek your face, we will hear from heaven and you will heal our land. Do you agree with that? Amen. Amen. I know you do. So our liberties as citizens of the United States of America came at a high cost, but so did our spiritual freedom. And that's what we want to talk about today. I found this old song. It was written in the 1970s by a man by the name of Neil Inhole. He was actually uh, visiting New York City. He was part of a men's quartet. And as they were out in the harbor and they were looking at the Statue of Liberty, these words begin to rise up in his heart. And when I was looking for it on YouTube, you know, I just found a bunch of men's quartets and it was pretty outdated singing this song. So we have invited a special family to come today and sing it for you. Would the Woods family singers please stand? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but you know, this, <laughs> this is Chuck and Sherry Woods, and they serve as our children's ministers. And very seldom do they get to be in a service because they're serving with your children. But I did want to point them out today, not as singers, but as ministers to our children. And Chuck, would you at least stand? And today is actually Chuck Woods' 50th birthday. <laughs> Yeah, that's right, your jubilee birthday. Anyway, <laughs> I should have had my camera up here to get the look on Sherry's face when I said that. Nonetheless. <laughs> Anyhow, I like to throw in a little humor, so if y'all are with me, I guess you are. So we're not gonna sing the words to this song. But if you want to Google it, there are some pretty good versions. I understand um, Phil Driscoll has a good one, but this song, the title of it is Statue of Liberty. But let's listen to these words. In New York Harbor stands a lady with a torch raised to the sky, and all who see her know she stands for liberty for you and me. I'm so proud to be called an American to be named with the brave and the free. I will honor our flag and our trust in God and the statue of liberty. But then he goes on and he's comparing the statue of liberty to the cross. On lonely Golgotha stood a cross with my Lord raised to the sky and all who kneel there live forever as all the saved can testify. We got any saved in here today? Can you testify that you have knelt at the cross and your sins have been washed away? 
It goes on and he says, I'm so glad to be called a Christian, to be named with the ransomed and the whole. As the statue liberates the citizen, so the cross liberates the soul. Oh, the cross is my statue of liberty. It was there that my soul was set free. Unashamed, I'll proclaim that the rugged cross is my statue of liberty. Can I get a witness? Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on that old rugged cross for us and shedding your precious blood. Amen. Amen. Jesus is our blessed Redeemer. He paid the ultimate price for our deliverance and for our freedom from bondage, from sin, bondage of the enemy. His precious blood was shed for you and for me. And the price that Jesus paid was enough to purchase our eternal redemption for you, for me, for whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. His precious blood is enough to cover the sins of the entire human race. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, I want to read this to you out of the NLT, Hebrews 9, verse 11 and 12. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. Now, this is what I want you to really see, verse 12. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time. And he secured our redemption forever. Hallelujah. Before Jesus died and shed his blood, the children of Israel had to offer sacrifices of lambs and goats on a yearly basis. They had to bring their best little lamb. They had to give Fluffy their best one. And Fluffy's blood was shed but it only covered their sins for a period of time. It couldn't take them away. It couldn't cleanse them. But Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus, his blood is enough forever, will be enough once for all time. We know that the enemy likes to remind us of our past He likes to remind you of your failures and your sins. Well, you call yourself a Christian. You call yourself righteous. What about this that you did? What about when you said that? When he brings those lies and those thoughts to your mind, you ought to say, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Devil, I need to tell you a bedtime story. (laughs) Once upon a time, a lot of bedtime story with once, start with once upon a time. And we need to say once upon a time and once for all time, Jesus, my Redeemer, shed his precious blood. He bought me. He saved me. Hallelujah. He cleansed me. And that old man that did that stuff is dead. My sins are washed away. They've been cast into the sea of forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west, so far has the precious blood of Jesus removed them from me. And his blood was not like the blood of any other human. His blood was not like the blood of little Fluffy. His blood is spotless, pure, sinless and powerful. 
Once he died, he took his blood when he rose from the dead and he entered into the holy of holies and the precious blood of Jesus is forever in the throne room of grace crying out, mercy, mercy, holy, holy, holy. Hallelujah. How many of you are thankful for the blood of the Lamb? He purchased our eternal redemption. The work of the cross and the resurrection was a completed work. Hallelujah. He bore our sin. He bore our sickness. He bore our poverty on the same day, on the same body, with the same precious shed blood. Hallelujah. Our Redeemer lives. Our Redeemer saves. Our Redeemer heals. Hallelujah. I'm thankful. How about you? When Jesus was here on this earth physically, he knew <clears throat> who he was and he knew why he came. And the Bible tells us in many places, but I like this account over in Luke chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 16 out of the Amplified. But this is when Jesus went to his hometown. He was raised, he was brought up in Nazareth. And so the Bible declares here, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and he entered the synagogue as was his custom on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read and there was handed to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. He opened the book and he found the place where it was written. So there's some things I want to point out before we go on here. Jesus had a home synagogue. It said he went to the synagogue in Nazareth as was his custom. Do you think if Jesus had the custom of going to his home synagogue, it's a good idea for us as believers to have a home church? I didn't write Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, but it does say, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. We all need a local body. We all need a church, a home church. You can find wonderful teaching on the internet and on YouTube, and I'm thankful for that. But those people are not your pastor. Those people are not your fellow b members of a local body. There is something about coming together. There is something about the corporate anointing that we all need need. We can see it throughout the scripture, but when I read this the other day, it just went off on the inside of me. He had a custom. That means a habit. That means something he did regularly of going to the synagogue. And then also I found it interesting that when he, he walked into the synagogue, they handed him, it wasn't a leather bound Bible, but it was a scroll. They handed it to him, and he, they were used to him reading. He was recognized among them as a good teacher, a prophet, but they didn't really know who he was. So this day, he's like, I'm going to take it a step further. I'm not going to just preach them a good little message. I'm going to show them in the Word of God who I am. So the Bible says he took that scroll, he's, he rolled through it, and he found the book of Isaiah. He found himself in the Word. Have you found yourself in the Word? On a regular basis, do you open up your Bible? The Bible is called the mirror, the mirror of God's Word. Do you open it up on a regular basis and you go, whoa, whoo, I just see myself as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When everything around you and even people are saying, you're not this and you're not that, see yourself. Jesus found himself in the Word. Find yourself, not according to man's opinion, not according to what people say about you, but find your true self in the Bible. 
What does he say about me? What did he say? Disease tries to attack itself to you. Find yourself in the Word of God with his stripes. I am healed. Lack tries to show up in your life and everybody says you're broke, you're busted, and you're disgusted, but you find yourself in the Word of God. My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. It's a good thing to find yourself in the Scripture. Jesus did that this day. And when he found the passage that described him, he read it. And you know he read it boldly. And he read it with the anointing. Verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And he doesn't say a anointed one. He said, I am the anointed one. I am the Messiah. Woo! You know, that scared some religious devils that day. I'm the anointed one. I'm the Messiah. And I'm anointed to preach the good news, the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to announce release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set forth as delivered those who were oppressed, who were downtrodden, who were bruised, who were crushed, broken down by calamity. That covers it all. He stood up and he said, I am he. I am your redeemer. I am your savior. I am anointed to bring you the good news. I am fulfilling this prophecy by the prophet Isaiah. Today it is fulfilled in your midst. He announced it. I'm your savior. I'm your healer. I'm your deliverer. And I'm here to bring freedom for the imprisoned. You know what freedom means? Free means not imprisoned. To release or rid. It means to be exempt from the control of another. If I were to ask for a show of hands, but I'm not. Some of you may have spent a night or two in jail. <laughs> Our beloved pastor, the old man, old Mark, in the drug days, night or two in jail. Oh, I wasn't going to mention names. Sorry, honey. <laughs> but let's just, we can all imagine whether we've actually been there or not. What a great day that is when somebody bells you out and they unlock the door. Hallelujah. And you're released. You're free to go. Hallelujah. And whether you've been in a natural jail or prison, that doesn't matter. But every single one of us were in prison. Every single one of us were slaves to sin and to wrongdoing. Every single one of us were bound by the enemies, the shackles that he had on all of us. And Jesus was saying here to, to these people, today, freedom has come to your house. Freedom has come to your life. And you think they would have been excited and jumped up and down, but you know what they began to say? Who do you think you are? We know who you are. He was in his hometown of Nazareth. You're Joseph's son, and now you're telling us you're the fulfillment of this great prophecy in Isaiah chapter 61. I don't think so. You know, people will always question when we rise up and we say, I know who I am in Christ Jesus. I know what he has done in my life. Some people, religious devils, don't like that. They don't like it if you declare that you are healed. They don't like it if you declare Jesus meets all of my needs. He wants to bless me. He wants to prosper me. But don't be moved by what other people say or how they look at you. You know who you are and what you are anointed to do, what you are appointed to do, and that's what Jesus declared that day. 
He knew exactly why he came. He came to bring healing to those that were bruised and crushed and broken down by calamity. Our Lord Jesus is the liberator. Yeah. Satan is the oppressor. Amen. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, we won't take time to read the first part of that, but I want to point out the last part where it begins with the reason. The reason the Son of God was made manifest, visible, was to undo destroy, loosen, and dissolve the works the devil has done. I love that. Jesus came to undo, to destroy, to dissolve the works that the devil has done. So I looked up this word, dissolve, and I loved it. Disp disperse, disappear, destroy or to disintegrate, to disintegrate. Hallelujah. You might be into sci-fi movies and there's a lot of them, you know, that some superpower or some evil force or whatever, all of a sudden people disintegrate. Ah! <laughs> Little pile of ashes there. But now the sequel comes and I, I won't tell you the movie in case you want to see it, but the sequel comes <laughs> and those disintegrated people reappear. <laughs> but you know what Jesus did for us? This is what he came to do. He came to destroy, disperse, and disintegrate yes. our past. Hallelujah. And it's not going to reappear again. It's a pile of ashes and it's gone forever. Under the blood, under the blood, the precious cleansing, saving blood. Hallelujah. Ha ha, devil, that hold you once had on me, you ain't got no more. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm free in Jesus. Glory be to God. Nothing binding me. Amen. Amen. The Bible tells us, oh, it has a lot to say about freedom. Can you handle some more? Oh, yeah, it's early. You can. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 in the Amplified. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, read that part with me. There's liberty. There's emancipation from bondage and from freedom. Hallelujah. Where is the Spirit of the Lord, class? He's in me. The Spirit of the Lord didn't just in heaven. The Spirit of the Lord is in whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord. First John says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I got the greater one living in me. I got the author of freedom living in me. The Spirit of the Lord is in me. Hallelujah. Bringing liberty. I've been set free. Have you been set free? Yes. Well, if that's the case, when we call on the name of the Lord and he comes and he lives on the inside of us and our spirit is immediately, not that we have to work for it, immediately we are translated out of the kingdom of darkness where? Into the kingdom of light. It's immediate that we become brand new creations in Christ Jesus. If that's the case, that when we receive him, that liberty and that freedom is given to us, then why in the world are so many Christians bound? Why are there not more Christians living and enjoying and walking in liberty and in freedom? Well, I'm glad you asked that. You guys are really a smart bunch. It's because we have to stand, we have to hold fast, and we have to contend for our freedom. Here's some keys to staying free and enjoying what he provided. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. 
in the Amplified. So Jesus said to those Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in me. You know, if is conditional. You have the choice. If you abide in me, hold fast to my teachings and live in accordance with them, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. If you abide. Abide means dwell. It means live. Wherever your house is, that's your abiding place. That's your dwelling place. That's where you live. And he's saying to be my disciples and to enjoy this wonderful freedom that I have provided. you got to take up residence in me. You can't just be a visitor in the presence of God. you got to dwell under the secret place of the Most High God. That's got to be your habitation. It's got to be your regular place that you are living and dwelling in his presence. Does that mean that 24-7 you're hallelujah? No, hallelujah. But it means that you are in communion and you are in fellowship with him. You are, have a rich relationship with him. And he said here, then the truth, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Anybody know what the truth is? The Word of the living God is the truth. So for us to abide and continually walk in freedom, we need to know the Word of God. The Word must abide in us, and we must abide in the Word. John 15, 7 in the Amplified says this. Here it is again about abiding. If you live in me, abide vitally united to me, and my words remain in you and continue to live in your hearts, ask what you will, and it shall be done for you. Live in him. Abide vitally united to him. When you hear the word vital, one of the things that comes up to me in my thinking is that if a person, you know, perhaps they're in an accident or whatever and they're rushed to emergency and they want to make sure that they're still alive, they check their vital signs. See how their heart's doing, see how their breathing is doing, because vital signs represent life. Could some of you look at your neighbor right now and just, you know, <laughs> make sure, see if there's a pulse? No, not really. <laughs> oh, that wasn't very nice. Stay in the spirit, stay in the spirit. But if doctors and medical professions look for vital signs in the natural as a proof of life, I think that if there was something like that in the realm of the spirit, we could check for vital signs to see if people are connected to the source of life or if they're just barely hanging on. Yeah. I never understood why some Christians live like, you know, one foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom and just like, you know, I'll just ride the alder bench into heaven. I'll just see how much I can get by with. That's not a vital relationship. That's not staying connected with the source of our life. I've used this illustration many times, but I'm free from the fear of repetition. Plus, I see a lot of new victims. I mean, new people <laughs> that don't necessarily come on Sunday nights. But grew up on a farm in Oklahoma. Most of you know that. We had like 160 acres and we had a lot of trees. We had palm, uh, palm no, no, no palm trees in the middle of Oklahoma. We had elm trees and oak trees. And I was such a tomboy. I just loved to climb trees. But we also had a big fruit orchard. And my dad would tell us kids, now kids, you can climb on any of the trees. 
kind of like Adam and Eve, you know, climb on those trees, but don't climb on the fruit trees. Why? Because if you climb on the fruit trees and you break a branch off, it's not going to bear fruit. Well, you know, of course, it's always, anything I ever did wrong as a kid, when he was old enough, it was Ricky's fault. But anyway, <laughs> where do we want to go? Climb on the fruit trees. Climb out there on the apple tree and you hear, you know, the branch is about to break. Jump off before it completely falls on the ground. And then, you know, as it comes time for harvest time and fruit bearing time, you could see that one branch, it would get leaves, so it looked pretty good. A lot of leaves on the branch, but not any fruit. And my dad would say, I wonder what happened to that branch? Why is there no fruit? Well, I don't know. Isn't that a mystery? What was the deal? It was barely hanging on. It was getting enough life to produce a bunch of brush. Leaves, but no fruit. And that's how some Christian lives are. They're kind of, sort of connected to Jesus, kind of, sort of attend church, kind of, sort of read the Bible, sort of, kind of pray. And so they are getting a little life, enough to go to heaven, but they're not connected enough to produce any fruit and not connected enough to enjoy freedom. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. How many of you want to walk in the freedom that Jesus has provided? Continuous freedom comes from continuous abiding in Him and in His Word. Back to John 8, verse 31 and 32 out of the message. Then Jesus turned to the Jews had, who had claimed to believe in Him. If you stick with this, living what I tell you, you are my disciples for sure. Then you will experience for yourselves the truth, and the truth will free you. A couple of phrases we want to point out there. Stick with it. Not get born again. I'm going to try this for a week or two. No, live it out. Tell Jesus and his word become a lifestyle. I heard a man of God say this, if freedom isn't lived out, then it dies. We have to walk in these truths. We have to live in these truths if we want to experience them. And then it says, then you will experience it for yourself, not just what you've heard others say. It's awesome to hear people's testimony. It's great that Pastor Mark walks in freedom and in liberty, but each and every one of us can enjoy the same benefits if we'll stick with it. Hallelujah. We can experience it for ourselves. And then the last scripture I want to read to you is in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. You're probably very familiar with it, but I want to read it out of the Passion Translation. Galatians 5, 1. Let me be clear. The anointed one has set us free, not partially, but completely and wonderfully free. We must always cherish the truth. And I really like this part. And stubbornly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. Woo! Cherish the truth. Do you cherish the word of God? Hallelujah. Are you being stubborn about not going back into past Bondage. The, the King James says, don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. But I like that word stubborn. Stubborn. If I were to ask some of your family members if you had any stubborn, they would go, uh, yeah, like a lot. Well, you channel that stubborn. Not a, toward people, but channel that stubborn toward the devil. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes with his lies and tries to take 
back that freedom that you have. He tries to entangle you again with depression or disease or, or whatever, maybe some sickness from the past, and he tries to come and put those symptoms back on you. Rise up and be stubborn. Take a stand. Say, oh, no, you don't. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And I refuse to be entangled again with that yoke of bondage. You're not putting that back on me. I am not going to receive depression. I am not going to receive fear. I am not going to receive disease. No, I'm taking a stubborn stand. And I shall not, I shall not, I shall not be moved. In the name of Jesus, amen. Everybody stand to your feet. Hallelujah.